أهلا وسهلا بالجميع محاضرة اليوم بعنوان Uniform Quantization This is an outline of today's lecture The focus of today's lecture is on the concept of quantization So first, let us define what do we mean by quantization Quantization is defined as the process of converting the continuous amplitude sample x of k t s of a message signal x of t into a discrete amplitude x cap taken from a finite and countable set of l possible values. In this lecture, we introduce the concept of quantization, define the uniform quantizer, derive the average quantization noise of the uniform quantizer, find the signal to quantization noise ratio, and present a number of illustrative examples. First, let us take a few minutes to have a general overview of the main components that make up the pulse code modulation system. As we have said in previous lectures, Sources are of two types, analog sources and digital sources. The focus of this lecture, the preceding ones and the upcoming ones, are on the conversion of analog signals into digital waveforms. So an analog signal can be converted into a, into a digital signal via the process of sampling, quantization, and binary encoding. This whole process is called pulse code modulation. So the input to the pulse code modulation system is an analog waveform. The output of the pulse code modulation system is a digital waveform consisting of ones and zeros. This whole operation is called pulse code modulation. Uh, this conversion process involves a number of steps. First, uh, we have the source, and then we have what is called a pre-aliasing filter. The pre-aliasing filter is chosen so as to limit the bandwidth of this analog signal to W Hertz in order to eliminate aliasing. So the first main component of the PCM system is the sampler. The sampling process was covered in the previous three lectures in detail. If W is the highest frequency component in a signal, then the sampling rate required to reconstruct the message from its samples should follow the Nyquist rate, where the sampling frequency Fs should at least be twice the bandwidth of the signal. The lowest frequency, the lowest sampling frequency, 2W, is called the Nyquist rate. Three types of sampling were discussed in detail in the previous lectures, namely ideal sampling, natural sampling, and flat-topped sampling. Now, the output of the sampler is a continuous amplitude discrete time signal. The input to the sampler is a continuous time, continuous amplitude waveform. The output of the quantizer is a continuous amplitude, discrete time waveform. The quantizer converts the continuous amplitude samples, X of KTS, into discrete level samples, X cap of KTS, taken from a finite set of L possible values, X cap equal X1 cap, X2 cap, and so on up to XL cap. So this is the focus of today's lecture. We need to understand the operation of this unit, which is called the quantizer. This signal belongs to a continuous set of values, the output of the quantizer belongs to a finite and countable set of possible values, x1, x2, up to xn. This set 
is countable and finite. The set of possible inputs is continuous and have infinite values. The binary encoder, the last unit in the PCM system, the binary encoder, each quantized level is represented by R equal log base 2 L binary digit. So uh, this encoder maps each level into a sequence of binary digits, depending, of course, on the number of quantization levels. We have this formula that are the number of binary digits needed to represent each level of the quantized set equal log base 2 of L. If L is 8, then we need three binary digits. If L is 16, then we need four binary digits. So in conclusion, this is the continuous time, continuous amplitude signal. This is the input to the PCM system. The output of the PCM system is a sequence of binary digits. The whole objective of the digital communication system is as follows. If we are given this sequence of binary digits, then how could we reconstruct the original signal, this signal, with minimum distortion? We answered part of, of this question in the previous lectures when we considered uh, the sampling, which means that to construct the message signal from its samples uniquely without any loss of information, we should have a sampling frequency of twice or at least twice the message bandwidth. Now we come to the other unit in this system, which is the quantizer. So we need to study the quantizer so as to minimize the quantization error and as such minimize the distortion incurred when the analog signal is converted into the digital signal. Now let us start our treatment of the quantization process. We repeat the definition of the quantization. Quantization is defined as the process of converting the continuous amplitude sample X of KTS of a message signal into a discrete amplitude X cap of KTS taken from a finite and countable set of L possible values x cap equal x1 cap, x2 cap, and so on. This is the block diagram of the quantizer. Uh, the input is the continuous set of samples, x of kts. The output of the quantizer is a set of countable and finite set of elements, x1 cap up to xl cap. We define the dynamic range of the quantizer the dynamic range of the quantizer is the range of values for which the quantizer is designed. It's given as x between x minimum and x maximum. So uh, this is part of the specifications of the quantizer. It has to do with the hardware of the quantizer. That is, this quantizer is designed so as to operate over this set of possible values between x minimum and x max. Uh, this range now is partitioned into L intervals such that if x of kts, the sample, belongs to some region ri, the quantizer output will be a level xi cap equal x1 cap or x2 cap and so on. Quantizer output is called a representation or reconstruction level. These set of values are called representation or reconstruction levels. The boundary points separating adjacent regions are called decision or threshold levels. The spacing between representation levels is called the step size delta. So this is uh, the dynamic range of the quantizer, the dynamic range extends between x minimum and x maximum. So the idea behind the quantization 
is to partition this range of uh, values into segments. So we have one segment extending between x0 and x1, another segment between x1 to x2, between x2, x3, between xl minus 1 and xl. So these are the regions or the quantization regions. If the, the continuous sample x of kts falls within this region, then regardless of its actual value, it will be assigned a fixed value x1 cap. Similarly, if the continuous sample x of kts falls in the second region extending between x1 and x2, then it is assigned a value x2 cap and so on. The spacing between representation levels, these representation levels is often referred to as the step size and for a uniform quantizer also the step size uh, is the distance between the thresholds x1, x2, x0, x1, and so on. As we can see, the input to the quantizer is this whole set of continuous values between x minimum to x maximum. The output of the quantizer is any one of these values. So these values are finite and countable. Um, X1 cap, X2 cap, X3 cap, up to XL cap, these are called the representation or reconstruction levels. Uh, the boundaries X01, X0, X1, X2, X3, these are the thresholds. These are the, the boundaries that separate these adjacent decision regions. This is one decision region, this is another decision region, a decision region, and so on. So the boundaries for the decision regions, these boundaries are called decision or threshold levels. Now we take a closer look at the characteristic of the quantizer. Uh, in particular, we consider the characteristic of the uniform quantizer. A quantizer is called uniform when the L regions are of equal length delta and the spacing between representation levels is uniform and equals to delta. For a uniform quantizer, the spacing between x0 to x1, x1 to x2, x2 to x3, these spacings are equal and they are equal to a constant value we call delta. In addition, the spacing between the representation levels x1 cap and x2 cap is also delta. And the same applies to the spacing between x2 cap and x3 cap. The input-output characteristic of a uniform quantizer of the mid-rise type is shown below for L equal 8, for L quantization levels. The dynamic range of the quantizer varies between x minimum and x maximum, which means that delta equal x max minus x min divided by the number of levels L. Delta equal x max minus x min divided by the number of segments and the number of segments is l so this is this is the step size for values of the input to the quantizer for values of the input quantizer between zero to delta the output of the quantizer is a constant value delta over 2 irrespective of the actual value 
of the sample value x. Similarly, if the input sample x falls between delta and 2 delta, then the output is taken halfway between delta and 2 delta, which is at 3 delta over 2. And again, this value is constant irrespective of the actual value of the sample. This quantizer is called mid-rise type because zero is not one of these representation values. That is, either the output is delta over 2 or minus delta over 2, 3 delta over 2, minus 3 delta over 2, and so on. Zero is not one possible realization of the output of the quantizer. So for a uniform quantizer, the representation value is taken halfway between x0 to x1. So it falls in the middle of this decision region. And similarly, for this segment, the representation value falls halfway between x1 and x2. x3 falls halfway between x2 and x3, and so on. So this is what uh, distinguishes the uniform quantizer. When the spacing between adjacent levels is made small, x cap of kts can be made practically indistinguishable from x of kts. There is always a loss of information associated with the quantization process. Therefore, it's not possible to completely recover the sampled signal from the quantized signal. We shall see later that as the number of quantization levels increases, the distortion uh, associated with the quantization process decreases, that is the error associated with the quantization. This error decreases as the number of quantization levels increases. The error per sample for the quantizer is defined as the input sample minus the output of the quantizer. That is the difference between x and x cap. As the number of quantization levels increases, the difference between the input and output of the quantizer decreases, and therefore the whole or the average quantization noise will also become smaller. Let us take this example. Uh, the input signal x of t equal cosine 2 pi t is uniformly sampled at a rate of 20 samples per second. The samples are applied to a sign detector whose input-output characteristic is defined as y equal 0.5 for x between 0 to 1 minus 0.5 for x between minus 1 and 0. So this is the characteristic of the 1-bit quantizer. For values of x, for values of x between 0 and 1, the output takes on the value 0.5. And for values of x, if the sample values um, take any value between 0 to minus 1, the output is minus 0.5. So for this example, we have uh, one threshold, one threshold, and one threshold. Uh, this threshold is minus 1, and 0, and 1, and the representation values, or the quantizer output values, are 0.5 and minus 0.5. As we can see, this distance between minus 1 to 0, which we call delta, equal 1, and this distance also between 0 to 1 
equals one, that's the same delta. In addition, the distance between this representation level minus 0.5 and this representation level 0.5, the spacing between these two uh, representation levels is also one. So we have one, one, and also one. The next figures depict the input samples to the sign detector. This is the sign detector, the quantized output, and the quantization error defined as E, the error equal the input sample minus the quantized output. Of course, uh, we can calculate delta as the difference between uh, 1 and minus 1, and we div divide by the number of quantization levels. In this example, the number of quantization levels is 2, and therefore delta equal 2 divided by 2 equal 1. So for this example, delta equal 1. As for the error, let us take a few examples. At t equal to 0, the sine function takes on the value 1, and 1, this is the continuous sample, 1 falls in this region, and so it is assigned this quantization level 0.5. So this is the quantizer output corresponding to 1, and the difference now is x minus y equal 0 0.5. So for this sample, the error is 0.5. At t equals 0 0.05, we take another sample from the cosine function. This sample, uh, this sample value is 0 0.9511. This is the sample value. Again, it falls in this region, and therefore it is assigned uh, this quantization level, which is 0 0.5. So this is the quantizer output corresponding to the sample, 0.5, and the error, again, is the difference between this sample value and the quantizer output, which is 0.4511. We can repeat this calculation for all samples. We observe one interesting thing about the error is that it's for this example, it's bounded between minus 0.5 and 0.5. So, for uh, if the input sample falls in this region, then the error varies between 0 to 0.5. And also, if the if the if the sample falls in this region again, the error, the absolute value of the error, is bounded by 0.5. Now, if if the sample value falls in this region, then it's assigned to minus 0.5, meaning, again, that the error will be limited or will be bounded by delta over 2. And if the sample value falls in this region, again, the absolute value of the error is bounded between 0 and delta over 2. So regardless of the sample value, regardless of where the sample value falls, the absolute value of the error is always less than delta over 2. Now we show that, we show this example graphically. The signal x of t equal cosine 2 pi t is uniformly sampled at a rate of 20 samples per second. The samples are applied to a sign detector, which is the one-bit quantizer. Binary digits are assigned to the quantizer output. So, these are the samples taken from the cosine function. As we said, uh, we took 20 samples per second, that is, within one cycle of the cosine function, we have taken 20 samples. Now, these samples are applied to the one-bit quantizer, and as we have explained on the previous slide, this sample is mapped into 0.5. The next one is mapped into uh, 
0.5 and so on. If the sample values are positive, they are given one fixed value, which is 0.5. If the sample values are negative, they are given one constant value, which is minus 0.5. Now we come to the boundary. In this example, we have the sample values equal to zero. So this sample value is zero. This sample value is zero. What shall we do with these samples? Actually, if the sample value is zero, uh, whether we assign it to 0.5 or assign it to minus 0.5, the error is the same. We can assign it to either plus 0.5 or minus 0.5, and the error in both cases is the same and equal to 0.5. So in terms of error, it doesn't matter whether we assign it to 0.5 or we assign it to minus 0.5. Here, this zero was given the value plus 0.5, and this zero was given the value minus 0.5. We can also plot the error, which is the difference between the sample and the quantized value, and this is a plot of the error. As we can see, again, the error varies between plus 0.5 and minus 0.5. The absolute value of the error will never be greater than 0.5, which is delta over 2. The next, the, next step, the next step is the assignment of binary digits 1s and zeros to the output of the quantizer. In, in our case, the quantizer output assumes only two values, two levels, which means that we need only one binary digit to represent the quantizer output. So for 0.5, we have chosen to represent it uh, with digit 1 and minus 0.5 with digit 0. Now, this is how the binary representation corresponding to this uh, analog signal will look like. We have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 1, 1, 1, 1. In this example, we have demonstrated how we can convert this analog signal, x of t, into a sequence of binary digits. So this is, this is an example of a pulse code modulation system. Now let us repeat the same example, but now instead of having just two levels, we will assume that our quantizer will have four representation or four quantization levels. So the signal x of t equal cosine 2 pi t is sampled uniformly at a rate of 20 samples per second. The samples are applied to a four level uniform quantizer with input output characteristic of the form y of t equal 0.75 for values of x between 0.5 and 1, 0.25 for x between 0 and 0.5, minus 0.25 for x between minus 0.5 and 0, and uh, minus 0.75 for values of x between minus 1 and minus 0.5. So this is our quantizer. The input to the quantizer are the same values taken from this sinusoidal signal. Now the output of the quantizer assumes any one of these four possible levels. The dynamic range of the quantizer is assumed to be between minus one and one, and we need to partition this region into four, into four levels. So we have zero, 0.5 plus 1, minus 0.5, and minus 1. These are the thresholds. These are the values that separate the decision regions. Halfway between minus 1 and minus 0.5 
is minus 0 0.75. So this is the representation level for this segment. And minus 0 0.25 falls halfway between 0 and minus 0.5. So this is another representation level. And then we have 0 0.25 and 0 0.75. As we can see, this is our delta, which we can compute from here. This is 1. This is the maximum minus the minimum, which is minus 1, divided by the number of segments, the number of quantization levels, which is 4. And the step size in this case is 0.5. This is the step size the separation between thresholds and the separation between representation levels. So the separation between representation levels is 0 0.5 and the separation between the thresholds is also 0 0.5. Now let us consider what happens to these uh, samples which are taken from uh, the signal. For example, at t equal to 0, again, the signal assumes the value 1. And looking at the quantizer characteristic, this is 1. This one falls within this segment. And therefore, the output of the quantizer will be 0 0.75. So the output of the quantizer is 0.75. Now the error, the error, which is the difference between the input to the quantizer and the output of the quantizer, the difference is 1 minus 0 0.75 equal 0 0.25. Again, for the sample value at t equal 0 0.05, uh, the sample value equals 0 0.9511. Again, it falls in here. And again, it is assigned to this quantized output, which is 0 0.75. And the difference or the error is 0 0.2011. And we repeat the calculation for all, uh, for all sample values. Again, we see in this case that the maximum value of the error is delta over 2, which is 0 0.25. So we have, by increasing the number of quantization levels from 2 to 4, we have succeeded in decreasing the maximum value of the error from 0.5 to 0 0.25. We recall that the error for the one bit quantizer is uh, the maximum value of the error is 0.5. For the same signal, when we uh, use a four level quantizer, the maximum value of the quantization error becomes 0 0.25. Again, we plot the curves corresponding to the message to the quantized signal and to the error. So the signal x of t equal cosine 2 pi t is sampled uniformly at a rate of 20 samples per second. The samples are applied to a four level uniform quantizer and then binary digits are assigned to the quantizer output. This sample which is 1 is mapped into uh, 0 0.75. This sample takes on the value 0.75 and so on. So we repeat uh, what we have done in the previous example. And again, when for zero, we can assign it to 0.25 or assign it to minus 0 0.25. In both cases, the error is 0 0.25. So if we assign it to 0.25, this difference is the error. If we assign 0 to minus 0 0.25, again, the error is 0 0.25. So this is the quantized signal 
Now, here, we plot the difference or the error between the sample values and the quantized values. And again, we, we, we can see clearly that the error or the absolute value of the error is bounded by delta over 2. The error itself varies between minus delta over 2 to delta over 2, which is minus 0.25 to 0.25, minus the maximum value here and the maximum value. Both of them are bounded by 0 0.25. In this example, the error is bounded between 0.5 and minus 0.5. In conclusion, as the number of quantization levels increases, the error or the quantization error decreases. Example, design an 8-level uniform quantizer with a dynamic range of minus 4 to 4 volts. Here, you need to specify the thresholds and the representation values. The dynamic range of the quantizer is between minus 4 and 4 volts. And we need to design an 8-level uniform quantizer, which means that L equal to 8. Delta, the step size, equal the maximum value 4 minus the minimum value, which is minus 4, divided by the number of quantization levels, which is 8. So in this case, delta equal to 1. Now, for the uniform quantizer, again, we see that the spacing between the thresholds is 1 and also the spacing between the representation levels is also one. So for the uniform quantizer, for example, we take this segment between zero and one, the representation level is taken halfway between zero and one, which is 0.5. Then this level for this segment, it's 1.5. For this segment, it's 2.5. And for th this segment, it's a 3.5. And we have also symmetry, that is, we have also minus 0.5, minus 1.5, minus 2.5, and minus 3.5. So in all cases, the error is bounded between delta over 2. So for these uh, values, any input segment which falls in this part of the characteristic the output will be minus 3.5 and the error will be bounded by 0.5. Also for this segment, if the input sample assumes any value between 1 and 1.5, the output will be 1.5 and the maximum value of the error will be 0.5. The question now, how many binary digits are needed to represent the samples. Now, since we have eight levels, then we can easily figure out that uh, eight equal two to the power three, which means that the number of binary digits will be three. So the, we need now for each quantization level, we need three binary digits. Find the representation value and the quantization error when a 1.64 volt sample is applied to the quantizer. So we have a sample value 1.64. 1.64 falls here. And for values of the input that fall within this segment, the output is 1.5. So this is 1.64. This is the corresponding output. So with x equal 1.64, y equal 1.5, and the error x minus x cap equal 1.64 minus 1.5 equal 0 
So this is the amount of distortion that this segment will incur during the process of quantization. This is a continuation of the previous example. Find the binary representation corresponding to the sample minus 2.1 volt if natural binary encoding is employed. Minus 2.1 minus 2.1 falls in this segment. The output of the quantizer for any value that falls in this segment is minus 2.5. So this is this is the output of the quantizer minus 2.5. Now we come to the binary representation. In this figure, we show three schemes by which we can assign binary digits to the quantizer output. The first is called the natural binary encoding scheme or the natural binary code. It starts counting naturally from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. For this sample, this level, minus 2.5, falls in this segment, and this segment is assigned 0, 0, 1. A natural binary means that we start counting with the lowest representation level, assign 0, 0, 0 to the lowest quantization level, and goes up until 1, 1, 1. The representation, the binary representation, or the natural binary representation for the sample value, minus 2.1, is 0, 0, 1. There are two other encoding schemes, the gray encoding and the folded binary encoding. Gray coding, we have for the first level, 0, 0, 0. For the second level, 0, 1, 0. For the third one, 0, 1, 1. What distinguishes gray coding is that each quantization level differs from the adjacent one by one binary digit. Minus 3.5 is assigned this binary sequence, 0, 0, 0. This one is assigned 0, 0, 1. Um, the, these, these binary sequences, they differ from each other by one digit. Now we come to this level, which is 0, 1, 1, assigned to minus 1.5. And again, this one differs from this one by one binary digit. Next, this level, minus 0.5, is assigned 0, 1, 0. This 0, 1, 0 differs from this one, this sequence by one binary digit, and so any sequence differs from its neighbors by one binary digit. We also notice that this final level also differs from the first one by also one binary digit. So we have zero, zero, zero assigned to the first level, and also one, zero, zero assigned to the last level and both of them, they differ from each other by one binary digit. The third representation is called the folded binary code. The folded binary code, one digit is reserved for the sign. For positive samples, this digit, one, 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 indicates that these samples are positive. Uh, zero, 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 zero indicate 
that these samples are negative. The first digit indicates the sign of the sample value. Then the rest of the levels are given in ascending order 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. The same applies for the negative samples. We start with 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is positive 1, then 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. This one negative, and then 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Next, we consider the quantization noise. The quantization error per sample is the difference between the input and output of the quantizer, that is, E equal X minus X cap. As we can see from here, each one of these samples suffers from a different amount of error or a quantization error. A better uh, measure of the amount of distortion is the average distortion across all samples. That is, instead of calculating the error per sample, we can get a better idea about the performance of the quantizer by considering the average quantization noise or the average quantization error over all samples. The time average of the mean square error, it's 1 over t, t is some observation time t, x minus x cap square dt. x is the input to the quantizer, x cap is the output of the quantizer, and then we have square. So this is, this is the time average quantity for the quantization noise. This formula means that we take the error per sample, square it, and then sum or integrate over all samples. This is the time average. The maximum error also referred to as the resolution equal delta over 2. When delta is small, the error E is assumed to be a uniform random variable over the interval E between minus delta over 2 or delta over, where the error is bounded between minus delta over 2 and delta over 2. So we can assume that the quantization error is a uniform random variable which varies between minus delta over 2 and delta over 2. We know also that the area of the probability density function is 1. Therefore, the probability density function of the error is a constant value, which is 1 over delta. So using this statistical approach, we can find the distortion or the mean square error, uh, which is the expected value. Now we replace this time average with the statistical average x minus x cap square equal the expected value of the error square and we can calculate this using uh, standard probability theory techniques uh, it's 1 over delta this is the density function and then take the error square it and integrate with respect to the error uh, substitute the limit between minus delta over 2 and delta over 2 and the result is this is the uh, formula for the average quantization error it's delta square over over 12. Note that delta depends on the design of the quantizer and not on the signal applied to the quantizer as we will see in the next two examples. So the quantization noise is something that has to do with the hardware, with the quantizer itself. It's not dependent on the message itself. We also note that there are special classes of processes where the time average and the statistical average are the same. These processes are called ergodic processes. Now we take a number of examples to demonstrate the concept of signal-to-noise 
ratio, signal to quantization noise ratio. Example, let the sinusoidal signal x of t equal a cosine 2 pi f0 t be applied to a uniform quantizer with a dynamic range between minus a and a. We need to find the signal to quantization noise ratio. We have a quantizer with a dynamic range between x minimum, which is minus a, and x maximum, which is a. This quantizer has L levels. The signal which is applied to this quantizer spans the entire range of the quantizer. So the signal, our signal, matches the dynamic range of the quantizer. So the average power, this is the sinusoidal signal. This is our signal. As we know, that's a sinusoidal signal. So the average power in the sinusoidal signal equal the amplitude square divided by two. Now the signal to quantization noise ratio is the average signal power divided by the average quantization noise. And this formula for the quantization noise was derived on the previous slide. Here, delta equal to A over L, this A minus minus A divided by L. If L equal two to the power N, N is the number of binary digits, then the signal to quantization noise ratio becomes A square over two divided by delta square over 12, this delta, and we have 3 over 2 L square. Also, we can, we can express this formula in terms of the number of binary digits or in terms of this integer n as 3 over 2, 2 to the power 2 n. Sometimes it's convenient to express the signal to quantization noise ratio into decibels. So we take 10 log to base 10 of this ratio, the result is uh, 6.02 n plus 1.76 dB. So we have two uh, remarks regarding the signal to quantization noise ratio. First, the signal to quantization noise ratio increases exponentially with the number of binary digits n. We have an exponential relationship 2 to the power 2 n which means that the signal to noise ratio increases exponentially with the number of binary digits. Uh, the other point, when we consider the, the logarithmic equation, it means that there is a 6 dB improvement in sig signal to quantization noise ratio for each bit added to represent the sample value. So this is another way of expressing the improvement in the quantizer behavior, that is, uh, for each additional binary digit, we have an improvement of 6 dB. So for this example, this is our signal, x of t, the signal x of t, the range of values for the signal x of t matches the dynamic range of the quantizer. And for this example, we have the best possible performance for the quantizer, that is for the uniform quantizer where the signal to quantization noise ratio equals 3 over 2 L square. We call this condition strong signal applied to a uniform quantizer. Let's look at this example which is an application of the previous slide. Let x of t equal 10 cosine 2 pi 10 t and the quantizer range between minus 10 to 10. Uh, our quantizer has eight levels and therefore delta equal 20 divided by 8 divide equals 2.5. This is the original sinusoidal signal and this is the signal in the frequency domain. We have one impulse at 10, another impulse 
at the minus 10. This signal is ideally sampled at a rate of 100 samples per second. Now we check that the bandwidth of the signal, the highest frequency component of the signal is 10 Hertz. And we're sampling at a rate much higher than the Nyquist rate. The Nyquist rate for this signal is 20 Hertz, but we're sampling at a rate of 100 Hertz. These blue lines here represent ideal samples taken from this sinusoidal signal. In the frequency domain, uh, we recall that the Fourier transform of the ideally sampled uh, sequence consists of an infinite number of shifted versions of the spectrum of M of T uh, shifted to the right and to the left by integer multiples of the sampling frequency. So we have one component uh, at zero, we have one component at zero, we have another shifted component at the sampling frequency fs which is 100 so we have these two spectral lines and then around minus 100 also we have these two spectral lines and so on at multiples of 100 so this is the spectrum of the ideally sampled signal next we plot uh, the quantized signal this is our quantized signal in the time domain and this is the Fourier transform of the quantized signal. We pass this quantized signal at the receiving side through a low pass filter with bandwidth equal to 50 Hertz, which is half the sampling frequency. Uh, this is the transfer function of the ideal low pass filter and this is the impulse response of the ideal low pass filter. What we obtain is a reconstructed version of the quantized signal. So this is the recovered signal obtained by passing the quantized signal through a low pass filter. Our signal X of T matches the dynamic range of the quantizer. So this example fits in the category where a strong signal is applied to the uniform quantizer. We repeat the same example now for the same quantizer. However, we apply a weaker signal. Let the sinusoidal signal x of t equal a over 2 cosine 2 pi f0 t be applied to the same uniform quantizer of the previous example with a dynamic range of minus a to a. We need to find the signal to quantization noise ratio. Now this is the uh, range of the quantizer between minus a and a and in this case we are applying a weaker signal to the quantizer. Uh, we can calculate the signal to quantization noise ratio as this is the average power in the signal which is the amplitude a over 2 square divided by 2 divided by the quantization noise the average quantization noise which is delta square over 12 as we have said before the quantization noise is independent of the message it depends only on the hardware of the quantizer so uh, this is the result. It's 12 over 32, 2 to the power 2n. Uh, if we take the logarithm, we can express the signal to noise ratio in a dB format where signal to noise ratio, signal to quantization noise ratio equal 10 log px over d equal 6.02n minus 4.77. In the previous example, the signal to quantization noise ratio was 3 over 2 L square. Let us uh, consider this application. Let x of t equal 1 cosine 2 pi 10 t and let, 
let us use the same quantizer with the same dynamic range between minus 10 and 10 and the same quantization levels, the same number of quantization levels in equal three bits or eight levels. So we have the same, essentially the same quantizer that we used in the previous example. However, our message signal now takes on a maximum value of one, which means that all the time our signal will fall either in this segment or in this segment, which means that the quantizer output will always be either 1.25 or minus 1.25. This is the message signal M of T, bit varies between minus one and one. Again, this is the Fourier transform of the message. These are the ideally sampled signal Again, we are using the same sampling frequency of 100 samples per second. And this is the spectrum. Nothing changed. It's the same as the one we showed before. But our focus will be on this quantized uh, signal. As we can see, there are just two quantization levels that this signal can take on. It can take on either 1.25 or minus 1.25. These are the output values of the quantizer. Let us pass again this signal through a low pass filter, pass this signal through this low pass filter, and this is the output. We can see that this signal actually differs from uh, this signal. Uh, the degree of similarity between this signal and the recovered or reconstructed signal is very, very low, meaning that we have incurred so much distortion in this quantization process. Now, this is a motivation for the next lecture. What is the problem with the uniform quantizer? Uh, let the sinusoidal x of t be applied to a uniform quantizer with a dynamic range of minus a to a. Uh, we have seen in the previous examples that the signal to quantization noise ratio depends on the signal power. As the signal power uh, decreases, the signal to quantization noise ratio decreases, quantization noise is constant. In the first case, let x of t equal cosine 2 pi f1 t. It's a strong signal applied to the quantizer. In this case, the signal to quantization noise ratio is 3 over 2 L squared. Assume that this signal is applied to the quantizer with a probability of 0.2. Consider the second case, x of t equal a over 2 cosine 2 pi f2 t. That's a weak signal applied to the quantizer. The signal to quantization noise ratio is 12 over 32 L square, and it's one fourth the first quantity, and assume that it's applied 30% of the time. Then take another signal, A over four cosine two pi F three T. This is another weak, weaker signal with signal to quantization noise ratio of four over 32 L square, which is one over 16th uh, of the signal to noise ratio corresponding to the, first, uh, to the first case. Assume that this signal is applied with probability 0.5. Uh, we can compute the statistical average of the signal to quantization noise ratio by multiplying the probability of occurrence with the values of the signal to quantization noise ratio. So we have 0.2 times 3 over 2 L square plus 0.3 times 12 over 32 L square plus 0.5 times 4 over 32 L square. And the result is 0.44375 L square. What does that mean? It means that strong signals will suffer uh, little distortion. However, weaker signals 
will suffer a large amount of distortion. So if the signal is weak, 50% of the time, this means that the overall uh, performance of the system will not be uniform across all signal levels, weak or strong. The solution is to use non-uniform quantization, which is the subject of the next lecture, uh, the use of which will ensure an almost constant signal to quantization noise ratio for strong as well as weak signal components. We need to maintain an almost constant signal to quantization noise ratio for weak as well as for strong signal components. هاي نهاية المحاضرة إلى اللقاء